Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on loads. We're in chapter 2, section 2, subsection 3, and this is our fifth video in this series, hence the designation with the letter E. We've been talking about W equals PS, where W is the line distributed force along a spanning member, such as a beam or truss. P is an area distributed load in pounds per square foot or kips per square foot. And S is the width of decking that's being supported by the spanning member. We've also been talking about P equals lowercase p times A. Uppercase P in this case is the total axial force that's associated with a certain area of floor that might be supported by a column, for example. P is an area distributed force in pounds per square foot and A represents the area of floor or decking that's being supported by the column. So A is in square feet and P is in pounds per square foot, lowercase p, and uppercase p is in pounds or kips. We've gone through writing out the equations and doing some calculations. Now we're going to do example calculations in tabular form. Um, when you have to keep track of a lot of data and do a lot of computations, it becomes useful to arrange information in some sort of table um, in order to keep track of it and, and uh, avoid confusion. Uh, also, learning to do this is useful because in a spreadsheet you can then perform the computations um, that you would have otherwise had to do with a handheld calculator or in your head. Um, it's this is the first step in using spreadsheets in this class and uh, I want to make a very emphatic point spreadsheets can simplify calculations enormously and they have benefits over uh, handheld calculators in that you can go back and look at the input data and track what you've done and find errors whereas with a handheld calculator, once you've typed in the numbers and multiplied or divided them out or done whatever mathematical manipulations you're going to do, you have no way of determining whether you put that information in correctly or not. So spreadsheets are enormously helpful. However, you always want to go through the process of writing the equations out longhand to start with and the reason is that you will have unit conversions that you have to account for and Excel is completely useless in helping you do that. So you're going to have equations that you write out that will contain conversion, unit conversion information and you have to do that first otherwise any equation you enter into Excel will be problematical in that you won't really know whether the units are handled properly or not. So, we're going to start this whole idea of organizing our data in some kind of tabular form. We've been talking about the two-story building where the bottom floor is slab on grade, then there's an elevated floor, and then above that a roof, and this is the framing plan we've been talking about. The column grid is 30 feet by 30 feet. We went through and we wrote out the loads, 20 pounds a square foot for the roof dead load, 20 pounds a square foot for the roof light load, 53 pounds a square foot for the floor dead load, and 100 pounds a square foot for the floor live load. We associated certain areas with certain beams, a five foot width of floor for the joist in this case, 15 feet associated with the perimeter girder and a 30 foot width of floor associated with the interior girder. And then we wrote out equations like this. Fortunately, the only conversions that we've had to deal with so far is we've been converting pounds to kips as a useful exercise just to remind ourselves that both those units are common and we have to be able to switch back and forth between them. But we have no special conversion factor, so the mathematics of these equations is really very simple. It's multiply one number times another number and do a conversion if you want to. So we did that for the floor joist, for the floor perimeter girders, and for the floor interior girders. And we could have done it for the roof, but we left that to the students as an exercise. All right, so 
Here's an example of how we can present information in a tabular form. For example, for the structure we just finished. So this is information that we can print out of a program like Excel. So it allows us to know what all the inputs are and to uh, perform the mathematics. Um, you're going to do this exercise first longhand to make sure you understand all the equations and then you're going to do the mathematics internal to Excel. So here we have the various beams, roof joists, single loaded roof girders, double loaded roof girders, and so forth. And by the way, I've sometimes been referring to the single loaded roof girders as perimeter girders and the double loaded roof girders as interior girders. Either of those is a valid description. We can also call the girders primary beams and the joists secondary. Uh, and again, those are equivalent terminologies. So the upper half of this table has to do with everything having to do with um, beams. So we have beams, they have certain spans. You'll notice here, by the way, the 30 here is in bold and the 30 there is in bold. These are not. Um, typically, I've set up the spreadsheet so these two numbers are an input because they represent the column spacing. And by the way, they don't have to be the same. I can have an uneven grid. But in the case of the example we've been working on, the column spacing in both the north-south and the east-west direction has been 30 feet. I wrote the number of spaces, uh, number of joist spaces along a girder. And if we divide that into the 30 feet, we get a five foot spacing for the joist. We know that this has to be an integer number and we can pick any number we want. And this is the output. Up till now, we've just given this and you counted those from the diagram. But in this case, we've made this the input and that's the derivative. So anything in black is derived from something in um, blue. Um, and then there's an exception right here. I should have put all these loads in in blue because they represent inputs also. And in the next version, I'll go back and change that. At any rate, we have a five foot width of floor for the, for the joist. 15 feet for the single loaded girder, 30 feet for the double loaded girder. And those numbers repeat again down here for the floor because the framing plan doesn't really change. So here we have the loads. Uh, dead load for the roof is 20. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this number, which is S times P dead. So remember W is equal to P S or W dead is equal to P dead times S. So we're going to say the number in this cell is that multiplied times that, which would give us a hundred pounds per foot. And, but then we are converting it to kips per foot. So we're moving the decimal over three places. So we end up with 0.1 kip per foot. In this case, uh, w dead on the single loaded roof girder is going to be 15 feet times 20 pounds per square foot, which comes out to be 300 pounds per foot, which is 0.3 kips per foot. So this is all, well, we didn't do the mathematics for the roof, but we did it for the floor. So let's jump down here. We're going to multiply this. Uh, area distributed dead load of 53 pounds per square foot times the five foot spacing. We get 265 pounds per foot, and then we convert that to kips per fit, foot. So this is the number that we derived previously through our mathematics. Then we're going to multiply 53 times 15 to get W for the single loaded floor girder. And that comes out to be 0.795 kips per foot, which is what we got before from our mathematics. And again, we would never want to write in a formula in this test in this Excel cell without having thought through all the units and written it out longhand first. Okay, for the floor, we had um, 
here we have W live, there's P live, here's S. So we're going to multiply 100, which is P live, times S, which comes out to be 500 pounds per foot. And then when we want to convert that to kips per foot, it's 0.5 kips per foot. So you can go through and check that everything in this table is consistent with the mathematics that we worked out before. Um, and then we're going to do this factored load case where we take 1.2, which is the load factor for dead, and we multiply it times W live. Excuse me. We multiply 1.2 times the dead and 1.6 times the live, and we add those together and we get 1.118 kips per foot as the total factored load accounting for all the load factors and all the dead load and all the live load. So that's the number we got before when we did all the mathematics, and then these are the numbers corresponding to the double loaded floor girder and here and the single loaded floor girder. Those are the same numbers that we got before. Okay, so you worked out these numbers. If you did the exercise you were asked to do to test yourself, you multiplied all these dead loads times the um, uh, appropriate S factors to get the W values, and then you threw in all the load factors to come up with this final answer. In this spreadsheet, by the way, uh, while we're doing all this tabular stuff, we're going to do everything we've done so far. So we're calculating up above line distributed load for spanning members, in this case beams. And here we're going to do the calculation of axial loads for the columns in this 30 by 30 uh, structural grid. So we're going to go back and refresh our memory about the equations. Um, we came to this point, we're using the formula P equals lowercase p times area. Again, this is the axial force in the column. That's the area distributed force we're accounting for. And this is the area of the floor that's supported. So we said this much floor is associated with that column. This much floor is associated with that one. And then this much floor is associated with this one. So we went through and we performed all these calculations and I'll refresh your memory that we calculated P dead from the roof on the interior column, P live from the roof on the interior column, and then we were going to talk about the place where the column is most heavily loaded which is between the ground and the elevated first floor. So we also have a dead load from the floor on the interior column and a live load from the floor on the interior column. And then we had to apply load factors. Dead load factor to that number, live load factor to that one, dead load factor to that one, live load factor to that one, and we came out with this number. So when we go look in the table here, um, if we look at an interior column, we see that it's supporting 900 square feet. We had uh, P dead from the roof of 20 pounds a square foot. When we multiply that 20 pounds a square foot times this 900 square feet, we get 18,000 pounds, and then we shifted the decimal over to convert it to kips. Then we did that same calculation for the roof live load, then we did it for the floor dead load, and for the floor live load, and we then applied these load factors to arrive at all of this information which gave us this total factored value in kips. 252 kips that that column has to be able to support. Now in your assignment you're going to be given uh, a PDF document that looks like this and you're going to be asked to calculate all these quantities for the 40 by 40 grid. So you're going to do all the line distributed load for the spanning member and the axial load for the columns. And the mathematics is all very similar but you have to understand where you have to make adjustments. And by the way there was no change in the loads here. It's 20 pounds a square foot for the dead load from the roof, 20 pounds a square foot for the live load from the roof, 
53 pounds a square foot for the dead load from the floor and 100 pounds a square foot for the dead load from the, for the live load for the floor. So everywhere here that you have a yellow or a pink cell, you're going to do the hand calculations to derive what that is and fill that into this table. So every student will hand in one of these sheets in their own handwriting representing what those values are. And you will then go through and uh, do similar calculations using Excel. I'm going to end this show and then we're going to go look at what that Excel spreadsheet looks like. So this is the example that uh, I did for the 30 by 30 grid. So let's just look at some of the computations that are done here. For example, if I click right here, you'll notice what this says is B9, which is the length of the roof girder, divided by cell C7. So it says equal B9 over C7. Now, this is, this is the essence of what you're going to do in Excel is you're going to write formulas that allow you to use various pieces of data and to operate on them mathematically. So when we say equal, that equal sign means treat everything after this as a mathematical expression and carry out that, those mathematical processes. So when this says equals B9 divided by C7, that's this number. And this is the number of spaces of joists along that girder. So we divided 30 by 6 and we get 15. And then this is just B7 over 2. So you'll notice this is B7 divided by 2. So what is B7? It's right here. That's the length of the roof joist. So it follows logically that the length of the roof joist is the dis distance from one girder to the next girder. And each girder supports halfway to the next adjacent girder. So that's why this 15 is half the length of a joist. So then we multiply 15 times 20. So let's look at this formula. Um, this is... Let me just slide this up a little bit. This is W dead we're looking for. So we know it's supposed to be P dead times S. So our formula says, for this cell, says equal E9, which is this, times D9, which is that, and then it's divided by a thousand to get it into units of kips per foot. So, within the spreadsheet, you can then do all the mathematics that you would have done longhand before. You did it longhand to familiarize yourself with the equations and any kind of conversion factors. It turns out in this case there aren't any really complex conversion factors, but there will be in future assignments, which is why you need to get in the habit of doing it longhand and then which helps you sort of get it into your head and then doing it in Excel, which helps you do it more efficiently. One of the beauties to this is once I've put this, these formulas in, I can do any grid I want to because this becomes a template and I can change this number and that number and that number and that one and uh, work out the solution. Let's go down and look for a second at the axial loads here. Um, for an interior column, we've got 900 square feet of area that's associated with it. We worked that out before already. Uh, P dead is 20 pounds a square foot. So when we look at this number right here, it says D35, which is this 900, times E35. So in other words, it's P dead times the area. That comes out to 18,000 square, uh, excuse me, pounds, because it's feet squared times pounds per square foot. 
So all the feet squared cancel out and we're left with pounds and 20 times 900 is 18,000 and then we shift the decimal over by dividing by a thousand. So all these formulas that exist everywhere in here, let's go look at one more. This is D36 times E36 divided by a thousand. All these formulas are are derived from the mathematics that we did previously. So you're going to do two assignments. You're going to do the 40 by 40 grid um, longhand and then you're going to do it in Excel and we will give you a PDF in which you can do the longhand version and we will generously give you a spreadsheet which contains labels like all these labels so you don't have to type those in but you will have to fill in all the data and all of the formulas so that concludes our discussion of tabular data and that's not even the right ignore that slide so that concludes our discussion of example calculations in tabular form where we're calculating w equals ps and uppercase p equals lowercase p times area so this is force is equal to area distributed load or pressure times area and this is line distributed load on a spanning member is equal to the area distributed load times the width of decking that's supported by the spanning member.